Well, hello everyone. I'm Pastor John Baird and I want to welcome you to the Way the Word Ministries television ministry. And as always, I'm completely honored to be here with you today. And as you can see, we are still in our Roman Road series. We're on message number 25. And that means that we're a little bit less than halfway through this series. And the title of today's message is your life is only as good as your mindset. And we'll be in Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 11. So here you and I are. We're going through the book of Romans chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And really, if you could take the entire Bible and compare it to mountain ranges all around the world, I believe the book of Romans would absolutely be the Himalayan mountains. And Romans chapter 8 would absolutely be Mount Everest. Why do I say that? Well, because Romans chapter 8 is really the key to living a victorious Christian life. And let me just say this to you. If you need a jump start in your personal time with God, might I suggest you take an entire month, uh, get up every morning and give yourself some time and read Romans chapter 8. You will be amazed at what that will do for your Christian walks. Now, a lot of times people, not just Christians, but people, uh, they can become so overwhelmed with doing the right thing that they inadvertently do the wrong thing. I'm not an expert on former presidents, but I'm going to tell you a story about one right now. His name is Calvin Coolidge. He was known as Old Silent Cow. And on one occasion, there was a dinner being held at the White House. And Old Silent Cow, he was sitting up there at the head of the table. And up and down both sides of the table were dignitaries and their wives. And everything was going really good at this dinner until they served coffee. And when they brought President Calvin Coolidge his coffee, he lifted up his saucer, took his cup off the saucer, and he poured a little bit of coffee in his saucer and then set his cup down and he began to blow on that coffee in his saucer. Now, this is a common thing that people do in the South, but the truth is this was a terrible breach of etiquette back in those days. Nonetheless, Silent Cal, he continued to blow on the coffee in his the saucer, again, he even added a little bit of cream and sugar to it. Well, the people at the table, the dignitaries and their wife, they were aghast, right? Because, again, this was a terrible breach of etiquette. This was considered to be uncouth. Nonetheless, because the president of the United States was doing it, all these dignitaries and their wives took their coffee cup off their saucer, poured a little coffee in there, began to blow on it. And if they wanted, they added a little bit of cream and sugar. Now, imagine their consternation when old silent cow took that, that little saucer filled with coffee with cream and sugar in it, and he bent over and put it on the floor uh, by his feet for his pet cat that had been sitting there the whole time. <laughs> so again, you see, sometimes people... They're trying to do the right thing, but they inadvertently do the wrong thing. And we're all guilty of jumping the gate now and then. Remember when everybody was running around saying WWJD, they'd say, what would Jesus do? A, a situation would come up and they'd think about it and they'd think, well, what would Jesus do? And then when they came to the conclusion of what they thought Jesus would do, well, then they'd go on ahead and try and do that. But let me tell you. That can be an extremely frustrating way to try and live. Because first of all, we don't always know what Jesus would do. And second of all, we can't always do what Jesus would do. But if you want your Christian walk to be an upright walk, there is a better way, and it's a way made by God, and that's to surrender to the will of God through the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you if you are a believer. If you're a believer, a God's Holy Spirit lives inside of you, and that's what our verses today are all about. And We're going to see two concepts, if you will, in these verses. We're going to see the flesh and the spirit, the flesh meaning your old sin nature, and we're going to see the spirit, meaning the Holy 
Holy Spirit and how your mind reacts to each of those. So let's dive right in here to our verses. The book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 5 through 11. Paul says, those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But since Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And since the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. And so what we see here in our verses, what Paul is telling us is that different mindsets can determine the way that you and I walk our walks in life. What Paul is doing here, again, he is contrasting between a mindset on sin and a mindset on following the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to look at both of those things today. Number one, the first one we're going to look at is the fact that if your mind is set on sin, well, that's a deadly mindset. So why is that a deadly mindset? Well, because it produces what you and I would call a, a deadly lifestyle. I guess technically that would be called a death style. But nonetheless, that's what Paul's talking about here in verses 5 through 8. And so let's look at three things that Paul has to say about these kinds of people. First of all, understand that Paul refers to people who are unbelievers or non-Christians here as those people. And letter A, Paul says, those people can't please God. See, they've got what I call faith frustration. Look at verse 8 of our verses. It says, those who are in the realm of the flesh, in other words, those who are controlled by the sinful nature, well, they can't please God. Now, surveys tell us that most people in America say that they believe in God, and most of those same people say that they want to please God, but they really don't know why they want to please God, because uh, the truth is they don't believe in God because they don't have faith in God. They're living in the realm of the flesh. And for people in the realm of the flesh, the truth is life is just a constantly frustrating experience because they think the way you please God is by ceasing to do wrong things, by cleaning up your act and getting it all together. But if we've learned anything so far in our study of the book of Romans, one thing we've learned is that we don't have the power to do that. Uh, stop for a moment. And think of all your sins and your mistakes and your failures like dead leaves falling off of trees. Now, somebody who knows a whole lot more about trees and leaves than I do told me one time that dead leaves, they don't actually just fall off of trees. They get pushed off. You see, when the fall season comes and the weather gets cooler and there's less daylight, well, that triggers a hormone inside the tree and that sends a chemical message to each leaf on the tree that, hey, it's time to get ready for winter. And what happens is over the next few weeks, these little tiny cells called abscission cells, they begin to form around where the leaf meets the branch. And as those little abscission cells grow, they slowly but surely push that leaf off of that branch and this whole process is a must if that tree's going to survive the winter and there's a great lesson in that scenario for us you see even as believers we can spend a lot of time trying to push things off of our lives things we consider to be bad and the problem is we're trying to push those things off on our own. Look what Jesus said in the book of John, chapter 15, verse 5. He said, apart from me, in other words, cut off from that vital union with Jesus, you can do nothing. 
we can't do anything without Jesus. Now, we try, right? We try to push those bad habits and those bad deeds and those bad thoughts off on our own. But we can't do it. The best way to do it is to allow the life of Jesus that's inside of us to push those things off and then let the new life of the Holy Spirit enter us and grow inside of us. This is an absolute spiritual truth. And if you can't grasp that spiritual truth, well, you're going to walk around frustrated for the majority of your spiritual life. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 6, the writer of Hebrews says, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And Paul is basically saying the same thing here in the book of Romans. He says, look, if you're following your flesh instead of following the Holy Spirit, well, then you can't please God. And it's your lack of faith that's causing you all this frustration. That's letter A. And letter B, Paul says, those people don't know God. I call this profession without possession. Look at verse 9 of our verses. It says, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. You and I, we're living in New Testament times. There are only two kinds of people on this earth. Those who follow Jesus and those who don't. Saints and ain'ts. People who have faith and people who don't. How can you tell one from the other? Well, the answer is right there in verse 9 of our verses. It says, if you don't have the spirit of Christ, then you don't belong to Christ. You know, people out there in the world, they can say anything they want about themselves. There are a whole lot of people out there who profess to being Christians who don't have the life of God living in them. And there are some believers out there, some Christians who say, well, no, that's impossible no one can claim to be a Christian unless they really are a Christian. Let me say this to you. That's not only possible, it's highly probable. Look at the words of Jesus himself. And these are perhaps some of the scariest words that Jesus ever spoke. You'll find these words in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, where Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. You've heard me say it over and over and over. Religion can't save a person because religion is man-made. It has to be a personal relationship with Jesus. That's the only way that you're ever going to receive salvation. You can claim all day long that you're a Christian, you're a believer, you're a follower of Jesus. But if you don't have the life of God living in you through the person of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, the Bible says that you don't belong to Jesus. So letter A today, Paul said, hey, there are people out there that have faith frustration. Letter B, Paul says there are people out there who profess without possession. And letter C, Paul says, those people don't submit to God. In other words, they're living without life. Look at verses 6 and 7 of our verses. It says, the mind governed by the flesh is death. That mind is hostile to God. It cannot submit to God's law. Now, someone might ask, well, Pastor John, how can someone live without life? Well, it's word breakdown time. In English, we only have one word for life, but the New Testament wasn't written originally in English. It was written in Greek. And in Greek, there are two different words for life. The first word for life in the Greek is bios. It's where we get our word biology or biological from. Bios speaks of physical life. Now, the other word for life in the Greek language is zoe. And this word is talking about a quality of life, about a spiritual life. For instance, in the book of John, chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. When Jesus says he wants everybody to have life and have it more abundantly, he's not talking about bios life. He's not talking about biological life. He's talking about Zoe life. He's talking about the spiritual life. Everybody breathing has bios life, but not everybody has the Zoe life 
that Jesus is talking about here. In the book of 1 Timothy, we find Paul writing to a young Timothy about a lady who's living only for pleasure. And Paul makes an observation here that really speaks to this point. Paul tells young Timothy, but she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. And I put a notation down there at the bottom, and I want you to understand what Paul says here. Well, this can be true of any he out there as well. The reason so many people out there don't have the Zoe life is because they simply don't receive it because they don't receive Jesus. There are a lot of people out there walking around who might look like they're alive to you, but the truth is they're dead. They're spiritually dead. They're living without life. And the reason they are is because they don't have Jesus. If you don't have Jesus, well, then the truth is uh, you don't have life. I remember people used to say all the time, life begins at 40, but the truth Truth is, life begins with Jesus at whatever age you are when you find him. And so Paul starts out our message today by talking about a mind that's set on sin. But then he's going to contrast that by talking about a mind that's set on the spirit. And a mind that's set on the spirit, well, it doesn't produce a deadly mindset like a mind that's set on spin. No, it produces a peaceful mindset. Look at verse 6 of our verses. It says the mind governed by the spirit is life. And again, that's Zoe life. It's life and peace. Could there really be anyone within the sound of my voice who doesn't want to have a life that's secure and serene and tranquil and filled with the peace of God? Well, look, the only way you're going to have that is to have your mind set on the Holy Spirit. Do you remember a show that used to be on television called Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous? Well, today in this part of our message, we're going to be looking at Lifestyles of the Redeemed and Faithful. If you've received Jesus, then you've received the Holy Spirit and you're living a life of faith now. You're redeemed. You're not living the same lifestyle you used to live because now you're living a life that's governed by the Holy Spirit. Paul tells us three things about the Holy Spirit's relationship to a believer in our verses today. Remember, I told you last week, Romans chapter 8 is all about the Holy Spirit. In the first seven chapters of the book of Romans, Paul only mentions the Holy Spirit twice. But again, like I told you last week, he mentions the Holy Spirit 21 times here in Romans chapter 8. And in the New Testament itself, the Holy Spirit has different titles. He's called the Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, the Spirit of Grace, the Spirit of Promise, the Spirit of Glory, the Eternal Spirit. He's also called the Counselor and the Comforter. In the book of John, chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus tells his disciples, the ones he was talking to in the first century, and you and I in our day here as well, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Now, the word for Advocate used here is paraclete in the Greek, and it means the one who comes alongside. So now let's look at the three ways that Paul says the Holy Spirit relates to you and I as believers. Letter A. Paul says, as believers, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 9 of our verses again. It says, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. And so that means that the opposite of that is also true. If you have the Spirit of Christ, then you belong to Christ because you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. In our verses today, Paul basically says four times, you are indwelt by God the Holy Spirit. Look at the book of John chapter 14 verse 17. Jesus is talking to his disciples here about the Holy Spirit, and he says, that is the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. 
the reason that Jesus can say to those disciples that the Holy Spirit was living with them then was because Jesus was living with them then. And Jesus is always filled with the Holy Spirit because it's his spirit. The reason Jesus has to say he will be in you is because Jesus hasn't been to the cross yet. You see, the Holy Spirit worked a little different under the old covenant than the new covenant. Under the old covenant, the Holy Spirit would fall on people and then come off people as God willed, depending on that person's willingness. But under the new covenant, once Jesus went to the cross and conquered death in the grave, the very moment a person has faith in Jesus, they are immediately indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Let's continue looking at these verses here in the book of John. John 14, 18 through 20, Jesus says, Because I live, you also will live. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me because I will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Again, the spirit of truth. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Jesus is telling them and us that he will literally be in us by the power of God, the Holy Spirit. We become the dwelling place of God, the Holy Spirit, the very moment that we receive Jesus. Look what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. The house of God is not a building somewhere. It's us. It's you and I. You've heard me say it before. Church isn't something you go to. It's something that you are. In the Greek, the word for church is the word ekklesia, and it means the called out people of God. Understand today, under the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, God had a temple for his people. But in the New Testament, under the New Covenant, God has a people for his temple. You and I are talking about mindsets today. And so you know again how much I love to do word breakdowns. Let's take a good closer look at this word mind. The truth is the word mind can be both a verb and a noun. As a noun, the word mind is talking about your thinking cap, right? That mindset that Paul is referring to here in our verses. As a verb, Paul is telling us we have to mind the Holy Spirit. That means we have to pay attention to and obey the Holy Spirit. Just like when your mama used to tell you, hey, mind your manners, boy. Or if I was to say, I got a mind right now to have the guys stop the cameras and turn off the mics and I'll go make us a mess of cornbread and beans and, and onions. Matter of fact, that doesn't sound too bad. You guys want to take a break and, and do that? All right, all right, we'll wait till we're done. Only you guys can do the cooking now. Nonetheless, when Paul talks about a mindset there, that's what he's talking about. You can bet Paul was from southern Israel. I've got no doubt in my mind. So again, letter A, believers are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And letter B, believers are filled with the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 9 of our verses. You are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. And so Paul is telling you and I there that as believers, we are no longer governed by the sinful nature. We are governed now by the Holy Spirit. And, and someone might say to me, well, uh, Pastor John, now wait a minute. Isn't being indwelt by the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit the same thing? No, absolutely not. No way. Look with me at the book of Ephesians. Chapter 5, verse 18, it says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. A believer is always indwelt with the Holy Spirit, but a believer is not always filled with the Holy Spirit. The very second you received Jesus, you were baptized in the Holy Spirit. The very second you received Jesus, you were indwelt by the Holy Spirit in his entirety. You're not going to get more of the Holy Spirit because you already have all of the Holy Spirit there is to get. And so the question isn't how much of the Holy Spirit do you have? The question is, how much does the Holy Spirit have of you? 
as you grow in your Christian walk, you're going to surrender more and more and give more of your allegiance to God, the Holy Spirit. And so being filled with the Holy Spirit isn't about you getting more of God. It's about God getting more of you. And so where is your allegiance today? Who are you following, your old sinful nature or the Holy Spirit? Look at that verse in Ephesians with me again. Ephesians 5, verse 18, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. So why do you think Paul said, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit? Why didn't Paul say, hey, don't commit adultery, but be filled with the Spirit? Why didn't he say, don't lie, but be filled with the Spirit, or don't steal, but be filled with the Spirit? Well, because again, Paul is making a contrast and a comparison here. Uh, if you're like me, maybe you've been drunk before, or at least you've known somebody or seen somebody who was drunk, and when a person is drunk, Monk. Right. They're under the influence. That's what we call it in our society. It's illegal to drive when you're under the influence. It might be under the influence of alcohol or some other substance. But what happens when you're under the influence is you act differently. The alcohol or the drugs that are inside you, they embolden you to do things that uh, you wouldn't normally do. I don't know, like put a lampshade on your head or something. But nonetheless, what I want you to see here is that in our verses, Paul is saying that being filled with the Holy Spirit is similar in an influential way to being drunk in that you are under the influence of the Spirit of God. The difference, of course, being that when you're under the influence of the Holy Spirit, you're not mixed up by your feelings or your emotions. And instead, what you're doing is you're following God's will in an orderly way. Why? Because God, the Holy Spirit, empowers you with a spiritual boldness. And so Paul's comments here are both a contrast and a comparison. The truth is there's nowhere in the New Testament where you're commanded to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit because as a Christian you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But there are several times in the New Testament where you are commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We just looked at one of those times in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18 where Paul said, But be filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The scripture tells you and I to grow in the image of Christ, but the key to a victorious walk with God is not simply looking at Jesus and then imitating him. The key is to surrender to the Holy Spirit of Jesus who's living inside of you to yield to him and then allow Jesus to live his life through you. And so as believers, letter A, the Holy Spirit indwells us. Letter B, the Holy Spirit wants to fill us. And letter C, as believers, we are renewed by the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 11 of our verses. It says, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. And so Paul is saying here that as the Holy Spirit dwells in us and fills us, he wants to change us. He wants to renew us. He wants to continue to transform and conform us into the image of Jesus. And so how does he do that? Well, I can think of two ways. Small letter A. He does it through daily renewal. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. It says, Therefore, we do not lose heart. In other words, we don't get discouraged, though outwardly we are wasting away. Well, the truth is your body is getting older. I know mine is. It's wasting away. But don't be afraid. Yet inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. The life of a believer, of a follower of Jesus, should be a daily experience of allowing the Holy Spirit to renew us. If you're one of those believers who thinks that the Christian life is just about having your sins forgiven so that you can go to heaven when you die, well, you're missing the whole point. Listen, the life of a follower of Jesus is a daily, sometimes a minute by minute or even a second by second encounter of renewal. 
Remember in the Old Testament when God gave manna to the people of Israel when they were out there wandering around in the desert? It was food to sustain them, to nourish them, and to refresh them. Remember every morning when they woke up, God had fresh manna on the ground for them. But the deal was you could only take as much as you needed for that day. If you took a jar out there and you tried to put manna in there and save it for the next day, well, when the next day came and you took the lid off that jar, all that manna in there would be rotten. You could only take what you needed for that day. And the same thing is true for you and I today in our walk with God as followers of Jesus. Look, the reason that some believers out there are so stale and dry and cold and indifferent is because they're depending on manna from 10 or 20 years ago. But our walk with Jesus should be considered to be a daily renewing from the Holy Spirit. That small letter A, we're renewed by the Spirit daily. And small letter B, Paul tells us about a future renewal. Look at verse 11. It says that one day, even our mortal bodies will receive life. Paul is telling us that these mortal bodies that you and I live in, one day they're either going to die or be raptured. But Paul says in either case, it doesn't matter because as believers, the same Holy Spirit that raised and resurrected Jesus from the dead is going to raise and resurrect you and I from the dead. Paul says even this mortal body will be raised. It's going to all happen when Jesus comes for his church. It's called the rapture. You're going to find it in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. I'm not putting it on the screen. It's homework for you to do. And I hope when you read it, you'll be encouraged by the words there. Nonetheless, I'm going to end today's message with this verse from the book of Romans chapter 14. It's verse 17 where it says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. My prayer for all of you watching today, including myself, is that none of us will be satisfied to simply be indwelled by the Holy Spirit. My prayer is that all of us will be filled with the Holy Spirit on a daily basis so that we can fulfill God's will, not only for our lives, but for the lives of those we love, even the lives of those we don't know. And so until the next time you and I meet here on the Way the Word television ministry, may God bless you, may God keep you, and may God grant you the desires of your heart all in Jesus' mighty name. Until then, I'll see you later, everybody.